All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to bring up our next speaker. Our next speaker is Ryan M. Jones, who is the official historian for the National Civil Rights Museum. He told me just a moment ago that he started investigating the assassination of Martin Luther King when he was 13 years old, and he's committed to writing a book, is that correct, about the assassination. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please help me welcome with a warm round of applause Ryan Jones, who will speak on the real assassins of Martin Luther King. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Mrs. Uh, Judith Baker and Mr. Hubert Clark for inviting me here uh, to Dallas. It's ex especially important to be here, considering that President Kennedy was murdered 56 years ago today. Uh, on a Friday here in Dallas. It was an incredible uh, opportunity to be at the Grassy Knoll uh, and to see the, all of the wonderful speakers and scholars on this case that can never go away and, and that should never go away. Um, what happened here in Dallas is strongly aligned with what occurred in Memphis, Tennessee on Thursday, April the 4th of 1968. And so what I'm going to go into is I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of Martin Luther King Jr. as a leader, his relationship with President Kennedy and the Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy, and then the unusual circumstances into the elementary investigation into the murder of Dr. King, and some parallels that align with uh, who murdered these men, who had the most to gain from it, and who had the power to cover it up. Goes back to around November the 5th, 1960. This is a few days before Election Day. Um, and Dr. King is in prison at the Reedsville State Penitentiary for participating in a sit-in right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And at this moment in the election, Nixon, or Vice President Nixon at the time, uh, for the most part, had the, most, the, majority, the majority of the momentum within the election. But Robert Kennedy understands that he needs the African-American vote, especially with Johnson being in the state of Texas. They weren't sure just how much they were going to get from Kennedy, who at this moment hadn't really spoke very much of civil rights. So Senator Kennedy at the time from Massachusetts makes a call to credit Scott King, and she said, he says to her, I'm going to do everything that I can. My brother and I are going to do whatever we can to get uh, Dr. King out of jail. And he does so in 36 hours. And Daddy King, Dr. King's father, stated that I have, a, I have over 500,000 ballots, and they're all going to go into the lap of Jack Kennedy. And we know that President Kennedy wins the, one of the most narrow elections in our country's history. Just 90 days into President Kennedy's administration, we know of the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961 where he was lied to by the CIA. Well, there's something going on here in the South as well. The Freedom Rides of 1961, where an interracial group of civil rights activists are traveling from Washington into the South to desegregate interstate bus terminals. And the Kennedys were extremely concerned with the violence that has happened in Birmingham and Anniston, Alabama. When we see the young president early in his administration kind of not take a stance on the issue of civil rights, many civil rights activists began, become somewhat frustrated with how less of, of what JFK was going to do on the issue of racial discrimination. But all of that changes on the afternoons of May the 2nd and May the 3rd, 1963. The entire planet Earth witnesses the inhumane and the dehumanizing images of children, seven years old to 17 years old, being attacked by water hoses and German shepherds. And Jack Kennedy was watching this inside of the White House, and he said that something has to be done with the issue of race in this society. And so on Tuesday, June 11th, 1963, Kennedy goes on national television. He gives a State of the Union address on the issue of civil rights. And some of those Southern Democrats, including George Wallace, Ross Barnett, James Eastland, who all publicly supported 
President Kennedy in the election of 1960 began to turn their back. JFK had just proposed to Congress the most important and strongest civil rights bill that this history has seen since the passage of the 13th Amendment at the conclusion of the American Civil War. The Kennedys, however, were concerned. While they began to, they did pledge their support to Dr. King and others in the civil rights movement, they knew that they had J. Edgar Hoover on their back. And Hoover began to become paranoid, possessed with the rise and fame of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to where they would begin to find any little thing that they could find to discredit him. And they found a man by the name of Stanley Levison in the civil rights movement who had ties to the American Communist Party. So we know what happens on Friday, November the 22nd, 1963. President Kennedy is murdered and Lyndon Johnson, his successor, takes over at Love Field, Dallas. Dr. King became the man of the year in 1963. He stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and gave his iconic I Have a Dream speech. He was successful in finding the desegregation of civil rights and the ending the era of Jim Crow with the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the following year of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. While LBJ signed those into act, those were both born in the Kennedy administration. So while LBJ is written in those history books, it was the courage of JFK during his first term to speak out for the pro-civil rights organizations in this country, and LBJ was able uh, to capitalize on that while the nation was still mourning the president's death. Dr. King began to transition himself, and while civil rights had largely been won law legal-wise in this country, he was still a minister and a man of peace, and there was millions of African-American men and men of all races who were going across the waters as first class citizens and are trying to fight for this country's freedom in the Vietnam War, which in a way, we kind of really don't know why we were there. And so to the day of his death, one year before, Friday, April the 4th, 1967, Dr. King delivers one of the most controversial speech given in the 20th century, and it's called Beyond Vietnam, A Time to Break Silence. And Dr. King says in this speech at the Riverside Church, in New York City, he says, a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. If America does not use her resources to end poverty and the war, she too will go to hell. Upon giving this speech, he severs ties with Lyndon Johnson, and he also loses support, his disapproval rating in America, within the African American community, is the lowest that it's been. So on December the 4th, 1967, Dr. King vows to take 500,000 500, Americans from all walks of the United States to descend upon Washington, D.C., as they had done four years prior in August of 1963. And this was known as the Poor People's Campaign. Dr. King felt that we are spending millions of dollars on the economic injustice of the war, but there were individuals here in, in our country that were working 90 hours a week and would still qualify for government assistance. And so this is the climate in Dr. King's final pilgrimage into the city of Memphis in the spring of 1968. Dr. King comes to Memphis after the tragedy occurs on February the 1st, 1968. Two African-American sanitation workers are on their route and it's thunderstorming in the city of Memphis. And unable to sit in front of the cab, these two men are forced to sit in the back where the garbage is. And a malfunction occurs and the two men are crushed to death. And Dr. King decides that this is the exact same cause of why it's important for the Poor People's Campaign to continue. And so he comes to Memphis, and up until this point, he's in a really depressed mood. He's not feeling well, and he's kind of at rift within his own organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And so he arrives in Memphis on Wednesday, April the 3rd, on Flight 381 at 1033 in the morning, and he's chauffeured to the Lorraine Motel. Lorraine Motel, we'll talk about the significance of the Lorraine and its role in the assassination in a little while. 
but he checks in at the Lorraine and he meets with local ministers on that day and he begins to feel flu-like symptoms. He has a fever, he's suffering from laryngitis, and he's scheduled to speak that night at the nearby Mason Temple. But he doesn't think that there's going to be a large turnout because there's tornado warnings going on in the greater Memphis area. So he sends his closest associates, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, later ambassador to UN Andrew Young, and a young minister from Chicago by the name of Jesse Jackson, all to the temple to speak for him. And once they arrive, they walk in to the east side of the sanctuary and they see 3,000 people in the weather. And they knew that they thought Dr. King was coming behind him. And so they call, they immediately know we have to call Dr. King. He has to come over from the Lorraine. And he reluctantly does so. And on that night, all of the profound speeches that he gives in his short 12 years as a leader of this civil rights movement, he says something this night that he hasn't said in any of his other speeches, even the I Have a Dream speech. He kind of goes through a eulogy of his own life. And at the conclusion of this speech, he says, well, I don't know what will happen now. We have some difficult days ahead, but that really doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anyone, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now because I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So tonight I'm not worried, I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. This was 1030 on Wednesday, April the 3rd. Thank you. This was Wednesday. This was the very final speech and address that Dr. King would deliver publicly. The next morning, he is in one of the most jovial moods that he's been in months. According to his closest associates, Bernard Lee, Andrew Young, Ralph Abernathy, uh, it was as if he had preached the fear of death, which he received over 500 death threats in his life after being arrested over 40 something times. He never leaves the Lorraine on this day. He's waiting for a federal injunction to be removed so that they are able to march the following Monday, April the 8th. They even have a pillow fight in room uh, 307, right next door to his room 306. He's preparing to go and eat dinner at a local Memphis minister's home, Reverend Samuel Billy Kyles. We'll talk about him in just a few minutes as well. And Dr. King goes up to his uh, room, he, gets his, he puts on his shirt and tie, and he steps outside of the balcony and he speaks to people in the parking lot. And he and Jesse Jackson share a joke about Jesse not having on a tie for dinner or a, a prerequisite for dinner as an appetite, and that's what I have. Uh, he sees a musician by the name of Ben Branch in the, cor in the courtyard parking lot, and he says, Ben, I want you to play my favorite song tonight. I want you to play Precious Lord, Take My Hand, and I want you to play it real pretty. His chauffeur, Solomon Jones, uh, calls up and says, Doc, it's getting cold outside. You should go and grab a jacket. And at 6.01 p.m., Dr. King's final words were, do you really think I'll need a coat? And shot rings out and lifts him off of the ground, and he falls back mortally wounded from a shot 205 feet away. And so this photograph taken by South African journalist Joseph Lau, we see here Dr. King lying mortally wounded and members of the SCLC pointing to in the direction that they thought the shot was fired from. Well, like with the assassination of President Kennedy, almost immediately it was printed that, all, that one single shot from a high-powered rifle came from a bathroom window in the top right-hand corner of a rooming house to cross the street. But at not even speaking to the witnesses themselves, they say that the shot, they felt it, was, it did not come from that area. They said it came from somewhere across the street in a large clump of bushes. So uh, while, Memphis, while Dallas has a grassy knoll, the city of Memphis has one too. Here's another photograph across the street. This is the Reverend Bernard Lee points, pointing clearly from where this photograph is stating, which was not shown to the public at the time of the assassination on Time Life magazine, he's pointing directly across the street to the, to the tall brush and shrubbery area, um, not to the bathroom window. So 
at the time of the assassination, we see the crime scene. Here's the Lorraine Motel. You can see that this area here is where they feel the shot came from. The eyewitnesses are pointing in this area, which was filled with tall brush and shrubbery. After the shot rings out, the Shelby County Sheriff's Department sees this bundle lying conveniently, not even 200 yards away from where Dr. King was hit by the bullet. And at the time, there was no formal investigation by the Memphis Police Department. So who was charged with investigating the assassination of Dr. King? Who was it? The FBI. And going back to October the 10th, 1963, the authorization of J. Edgar Hoover to illegally wiretap and surveillance all of Dr. King's homes, his churches, and his uh, place of business at this SCLC building in Atlanta till the last day of his death. It's because of the FBI's surveillance, which is why we really finally know what occurred on that afternoon. So who were they looking for? You're looking for a man by the name of James Earl Ray. A little bit about Ray. Uh, James O. Ray was no Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald was an incredibly intelligent man. Ray was the opposite of that. Um, he had no ties to marksmanship. He was dishonorably discharged in the Army in 1949. Um, and Ray escapes from the Missouri State Penitentiary on April the 23rd, 1967. This was a man who had committed petty crimes his entire life and would be caught within 10 minutes, and 10 minutes is a grace period. And so Ray escapes from one of the most notorious and difficult prisons to escape from for security in April of 1967, and he goes to Toronto, Canada. And while he's in Toronto, he comes into four different aliases of men that look exactly like him, using the names of Eric Galt, John Willard, Harvey Lohmeyer, and Raymond Joan George Sneed. Ray, assuming that he's the assassin, as we're told by Hoover's FBI, is that Ray wants to assassinate Dr. King because the independent party had recently elected George Wallace of Alabama as to run for the election of 1968. We know the Sunday before Dr. King was slaughtered in Memphis that Lyndon Johnson refuses to rerun on the Democratic ticket, even though he wins with the, the widest margin uh, in the election of 1964. Why does Johnson not decide to run? Well, because just two weeks before King is killed, Senator Robert F. Kennedy decides to announce his candidacy uh, for the election of 1968 as well. Ray buys a Mustang for $1,900 and he drives it all over the United States of America. He goes from Chicago to Los Angeles to Atlanta, and then he goes to Birmingham, and he buys a, a 243 rifle. He brings the, a second rifle into the city of Memphis on April the 3rd, and allegedly uh, kills Dr. King. So looking into debunking the theory of James Earl Ray as the lone gunman or lone nut as, as we call it. Um, Ray drives the Mustang first to New Orleans by the city of New Orleans. We'll talk about that shortly as well. And then he allegedly parks the Mustang in Atlanta on Friday, April the 5th. And then he buys a one-way bus ticket from Atlanta to Montreal, Canada. So this is an escaped convict who was able to receive a Canadian passport of the name Paul Bridgman. He flies from Montreal and he flies to London Heathrow's airport. At the time that he supposedly shoots and kills Martin Luther King Jr., his very first flight on an airplane is an international flight from Montreal to London. He goes, from, he goes to London to uh, Lisbon, Portugal, he goes to Brussels, and then back to London before he's finally captured by Scotland Yard on the same day of the funeral of Robert Francis Kennedy, who was killed June the 5th, 1968. He was captured on June the 8th, 1968. After Ray is extradited back to the city of Memphis, he hires an attorney that represented members of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan. And he, this, 
was committed saying that I was not the assassin of Dr. King and I would like to have a trial by jury. So he, he hires Art Haynes and he fires him mysteriously the night before the opening remarks were to take place. And he's hired by another Texas attorney by the name of Percy Foreman. And Percy Foreman was a great friend and uh, a colleague of H.L. Hunt, D.H. Byrd, and Clint Murkison here uh, in Dallas and, and other areas of the state. And it's allegedly that he's told that there is no way possible that you will argue any case for James O'Ray. We need to urge him to take a plea deal. Now, let's, let's be honest with each other. Uh, Ray was not one of the brightest uh, walks of life that in our country at that time. He had a second grade education. And he was told, listen, look in the history of the civil rights movement. Uh, from the, going back to the early part of the 20th century, over 5,000 African Americans were killed as a result of a hate crime. And not one person at that time was brought to justice for these murders. James O'Ray has been accused of murdering Dr. King, the most decorated civil rights leader of his era and of the 20th century. Uh, and I'm, com I'm convinced that we have not seen one with the same leadership since then. So Ray is urged to take a plea deal and he pleads guilty and he enters a judicial admission of guilt. This is not saying I am pleading guilty and that I'm responsible for the murder of Dr. King. I'm entering a judicial admission of guilt. He's given a 99 year prison sentence. 72 hours later, he recants that judicial admission of guilt and wants to have a trial here in the city of Memphis, in the city of Memphis, uh, and he's unable to do so. As a matter of fact, he remains in jail until he dies on April the 23rd, 1998, exactly 31 years to the day that he escapes from the Missouri State Penitentiary. So, breaking news, James O'Reilly did not murder Dr. King. Uh, and it's even more likely that James O'Ray had no f recollection of the plot against Dr. King. So what are some of those lingering questions? Look at the eyewitness testimonies that we've seen. Here in Dallas, at the, almost immediately after the fatal shot that comes from the right front of the wooden picket fence fires, dozens of witnesses run up that route, right? Well, the same thing happens here in Memphis. Here you see, the, this is exactly what Dr. King saw the very last moment that he, before he was struck by that assassin's bullets. You see all those brush and shrubberies there? Well, the following morning at 4.30 in the morning, it was completely cut down. This is how it looks the day after the assassination. This is the, this is six eyewitnesses who immediately went to the Memphis police and to the Memphis FBI and told them all exactly what they had saw. And we're gonna hear some of those testimonies in just a second about what they saw. These eyewitnesses were none other than the, the uh, SCLC's James Orange, Solomon Jones, who was the last person to speak to Dr. King before he was hit by the bullet, Earl Caldwell, who was a New York Times investigative reporter who was sent to Memphis to do a story on Dr. King's journey to Washington, D.C. for the Poor People's Campaign. And all of them testify that when the shot rings out, they all duck and they look and they see puffs of smoke. Okay, I'm not making this up. I know we've heard this before, right? Uh, in the right front uh, of the, the Dealey Plaza. And they see a man in this thicket wearing a white sheet over his head, crouching. He takes the sheet off and he runs off of the retaining wall and then one man runs west towards Hewling Avenue and gets into a Memphis police patrol car. And the other one, who was dressed as a policeman, comes onto the premises of the Lorraine Motel. Not one of these witnesses were called to give their official affidavits to the Memphis police nor to the FBI. As a matter of fact, they were not finally interviewed until the year 1993 when we were on the 25th anniversary of, Dr. of President Kennedy's murder and 25 years to the murder of Martin Luther King Jr. So what I'll do is I'm gonna let you hear themselves, the, the actual testimonies of two of the individuals who said that they saw the puffs of smoke. First, Earl Caldwell.
think it's skipping. See, it's sending me to the next. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, I just need to push play on it. Well, it'll, it'll be fine. Both men testify to seeing puffs of smoke and a man runs off of the retaining wall, runs west towards Hewling Avenue, and gets into a Shelby County Sheriff's Department's patrol car. Second, the entire essence of the case. James O. Ray admitted to being in Birmingham, Alabama, using the alias of Harvey Lohmeyer. And according to U.L. Baker, who was the manager of the firearms that he attended right off of Highway 78 in Birmingham, he could tell that this man had never, was not prone to buying firearms before. So the first firearm that he buys is a 243. For anyone planning to commit an assassination, this is a well-decorative rifle, not like the, the BB gun that Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly used with the, the um, Italian Manlikar Carcano. And I say that and mean it. Um, Ray, <laughs> Ray purchases this 243, and he takes it to a man that he's called Raul. And he's told that this is not the rifle you need. We need a Game Master 330-06 rifle. And so he returns the 243, and he buys the 30-06. He never has the scope of this rifle sighted. The rifle that you see here is the rifle that we house at the National Civil Rights Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, this could not and was not the murder weapon of Martin Luther King Jr. for reasons because the weapon was never tested in 1968. When James Earl Ray entered his judicial admission of guilt on March the 10th, 1969, Hoover says there's no, there's no reason for us to have a trajectory or a ballistics test. This rifle was not tested until 1993 and tested 33 more times in 1997. Not one time does the bullet that, mat that was removed from Dr. King's right neck chin area matches this rifle. Not one time. Judge Joe Brown, as we see here, orders to have the trajectory and ballistics test uh, performed. And he is taken off of the case because of the evidence supporting that this was not the rifle. So he's barred from this case. Lastly, the Lorraine Motel. It has been told in our narrative of the official investigation that Dr. King stayed at the Lorraine Motel between 10 or 11 times. Well, that's just simply inaccurate. Martin Luther King didn't even come to Memphis between 1956 and 1967, 1968, 11 times. He came to Memphis on three separate occasions, and these dates are listed. Uh, and I know that to be true because I have the logs of the Lorraine Motel uh, in my office in Memphis. He came on June the 7th, 1966, and he stayed in room 307. He came to Memphis for the striking sanitation workers on March the 18th, and he was committed to coming back to Memphis and stay at the Lorraine on the evening of April the 3rd. Now, the, the first time he came to Memphis, he didn't even spend the night in the city of, at, at the Lorraine. He stayed at a, an interracial motel at the Holiday Inn Rivermont. Well, after Dr. King decides to return on April the 3rd, after he leaves after a riot that begins on the 28th, J. Edgar Hoover releases this document on March the 29th, 1968. And it says in this document that Martin Luther King has urged Negroes in Memphis to boycott white merchants in order to force a compliance with Negro demands in the sanitation worker strike in Memphis. When violence breaks out during the march, King led on the 28th of March, he disappeared. There's a first class Negro motel in Memphis, the Hotel Lorraine, but King chose to hide out at the all white operated Holiday Inn. Martin Luther King, during the sanitation workers' strike in Memphis, has urged Negroes to boycott downtown merchants to achieve Negro demands. The fine hotel Lorraine in Memphis is owned and patronized exclusively by African Americans, but King didn't go there from his exit. 
Instead, he decided to stay at the, at the plush Holiday Inn white owned, operated by white patrons, which was a place to cool it. There will be no boycott of white merchants for King, only for his followers. Well, why did King decide to stay at the Rivermont? He stayed at the Rivermont because by 1968, segregation was illegal. So his whole purpose was to show we can live in an integrated society. He did patronize the Lorraine. He would have his business meetings there. It was one of the only places that was not bugged, or was it? The owner of the Lorraine Motel, in this photograph that we see here, this is Walter Bailey. Walter Bailey and his wife, Lori, purchased this property in 1945, uh, and they renamed it as the Lorraine after their favorite song by Nat King Cole, The Sweet Lorraine. And in the 50s and 60s, if you were African American and you were traveling to do a concert, or you were a celebrity, from Jackie Robinson to Sam Cooke to Aretha Franklin to the Motown artists, anyone who was anyone would be a guest at the Lorraine, um, as, as well as Dr. King. We just recently found out as of this year uh, that Walter Bailey was an informant for the Memphis Police Department under the name Mr. Smith. So on the night of the assassination, when Mr. Bailey hears the shot ring out, uh, his wife, who normally was on the switchboard, was not on the switchboard that day. And he says that, operator, this is a, a major emergency. Dr. King has been shot at the Lorraine. Get me an ambulance, get me the peace, and also get me the FBI. When the shot rings out, Mrs. Bailey realizes that something has happened. And she continues to hit her side on the side of the head, and she says, why, why, why? Well, before Dr. King arrived in Memphis, Dr. King's room was going to be in room 202. On April the 2nd, two days before he was murdered and a day before he arrived in Memphis, his room was changed. And who was the identity of the person that changed his room? We're not sure. But these files here talk a little bit about the motel owner's changing of the room. Shortly after the shot rings out, Mrs. Bailey has a seizure and she dies of brain hemorrhage five days later at the same time that Dr. King is being laid to rest uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. So mysteriously, this woman who had wonderful health and is seen visibly shaken after what she sees up on the balcony of a, of a morally fallen Dr. King goes into a seizure and dies uh, the same night of the assassination. Memphis police involvement. For, for Dr. King's own security, African-American officers were stationed in the vicinity of the Lorraine Motel. These three men, Floyd Newsom, Detective Earl Reddit, and Norvell Wallace were stationed across the street to look in surveillance for Dr. King's own protection. And this was strictly to see what license plates were driving in, who was going in and out of what door at the Lorraine. They knew everything that happened. Well, after Dr. King gave that profound speech on the night before he was killed, Mr. Wallace and Mr. Newsom were called at 1 a.m. Um, and they were told that they were not needed at fire station number two, which was directly across from the Lorraine Motel. They were sent to different precincts in other areas of the city. The precincts that they were sent to were overstaffed. The precinct across the street from the Lorraine was heavily understaffed. 90 minutes before the assassination, Detective Ed Reddick receives a, an order from the Memphis Police Commissioner of Public Safety, a man named Frank Holloman, before taking over the job as the Memphis Police Commissioner of Public Safety. He worked as a fifth ranking FBI agent under J. Edgar Hoover and was actually given his referral to go to Memphis from Hoover in 1966. Holloman looks at uh, Earl Reddick, Ed Reddick and he says that uh, there is a contract on your life and you and your family must go into cover right now. And Reddick says, well, Mr. Holloman, I thank you for giving me that, uh, you know, this information, but you take care of my family and I will stay on the street. And he made it into an order. 90 minutes later, Dr. King was shot on the balcony of the Lorraine. The very next day, Friday, April the 5th, all three men were told to report back to Memphis Fire Station number two, 
the one that was directly across from the Lorraine Motel. Samuel Kyles was the Memphis minister that Dr. King uh, was going to eat at dinner that night. And according to Memphis TAC 10 officers, it was Reverend Kyles who ordered to have the TAC 10 officers removed from the area of the Lorraine Motel. Also, the logs of April the 3rd and April the 4th on that day, we see all of Dr. King's closest associates have rooms at the Lorraine. And they were all from Atlanta, Georgia, 334 Auburn Avenue, Atlanta. Well, there was one person that had a room at the Lorraine Well as well. Uh, and he was a Memphian, and it was Billy Kyles. And he was staying in room 312. If you're familiar with the structure of the Lorraine and the room that Dr. King was conveniently put in front of in 306, it has the same exact trajectory to room 312. So had Dr. King not been in room 306, it's very likely that he would have been in room 312. Mr. Kyle's statement has changed over 51 years. So we also, it's believed that he too was an informant for the Memphis FBI. Unlike for Lee Harvey Oswald, we know what happened to him just 48 hours after he was grossly accused of murdering President Kennedy and James O. Ray's fight for having a trial in the city of Memphis uh, he's unsuccessful 31 years later. So Dr. King's family longly believed that Ray was an innocent man and that he was some way of a patsy. There is a civil suit, this is Memphis public record, that in November and December 1999, we, we are approaching, we are on the 20th anniversary of this civil suit, a wrongful death suit of a man that was named Lloyd Jowers. Um, and that he goes on national television with Sam Donaldson in 1993, and he says that he was approached by a man named Frank Liberto, who was a Memphis mob boss, uh, to a $100,000 contract to murder Martin Luther King Jr. Mr. Liberto is close associates with Carlos Marcello of New Orleans, closest associates with Sam Giancana of Chicago. Um, and it's, it's rumored that he has business ties because he, too, owned bars in the outskirts of Memphis. He has associates with a man named Jack Ruby. As a matter of fact, the woman that we know as Jada, Janet Conforto, worked for Frank Liberto prior to going to Dallas and working at Ruby's Carousel Club. Dexter King meets James O'Reilly in prison after he's dying of illness of liver, of liver cancer and hepatitis B. And he says that we're going to do our best to get a trial. We know that this doesn't happen. So the following year, William Pepper, the final attorney of James O'Reilly, and represents the King family in a wrongful death suit that kills, that, that exonerates uh, James O'Reilly as the assassin. Seventy witnesses are produced. Six black, six white jurors in less than an hour come back and say that James O'Reilly was not the assassin of Martin Luther King Jr and that we will find the murders of the assassination of Dr. King in the CIA, the Memphis Police Department, and other forms of the United States government. This is public record exonerating uh, an accused assassin. And to this day, in the front page of the Memphis newspaper, it was not printed at all until you reached a very small snippet of it uh, on the fifth page. And to this day, it is still highly and widely unrecognized. So who killed Martin Luther King Jr.? What really happened that day? As Dr. King is at the Lorraine Motel, we know that there are two teams that are across the street. One is at the fire station, which is why two African-American firemen were removed. Uh, and it's likely that two Memphis police officers uh, who were sharpshooters, lieutenants in the Memphis Police Department, were in that infamous grassy knoll uh, 205 feet away. Um, Here's a photograph of Jesse Jackson telling me what he saw uh, on that afternoon. In closing and conclusion, uh, it's important to remember the, the reasons that Dr. King, Robert Kennedy, and John F. Kennedy posed to people who wanted to end, pe who wanted to end peace and wanted to have peace and justice in this, in this country. Um, all three men, we know that National Security Memorandum 263 brought home 1,000, was going to bring home 1,000 troops from Southeast Asia 
And it's extremely likely that there would have been no Vietnam War by 1965 had Dallas not occurred on November the 22nd. Dr. King goes on national TV and gives a speech on the issue of Vietnam exactly one year to the day of his death. And while Dr. King is in a morgue in Memphis, Robert Kennedy gives a speech in his behalf in Indianapolis to an all African American crowd. And his entire short lived campaign is on what? Ending the Vietnam War. We have three decorated and distinguished men, no matter what color they were, who were adamantly against the war in Vietnam and they all are killed by a gunshot wound to the head. And still 56 and 51 years later, uh, we really kind of still don't know who did it. So again, Mrs. Baker, Mr. Clark, everyone here, uh, I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come and I'll be around uh, here the rest of the weekend to talk more about the assassination. Thank you.